continue on a little bit um, from Pastor Patrice's sermon last week in the book of 1 Corinthians from our lectionary uh, reading this Sunday. So listen to and for God's word for you this morning. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through foolishness, the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not, not many of you were powerful. Not many were no, of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who is becoming for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Indeed. Which is better, in your opinion? More or less? I got a bunch, so just ponder them. Which is better, slower or faster? Good answer, Elizabeth. It depends. Bigger or smaller? Your assets or your flaws? Winning or losing? Death or life? Happiness or sadness? Success or failure? Ponder how our culture, which we are a part of, would answer these questions. Think of commercials, if you still see commercials these days. In a culture of power grabbing, the message of the cross can seem like stupidity, idiocy, and foolishness, depending on where you stand, to Elizabeth's point. In a culture where might makes right, the message of the cross can seem pathetic, feeble, and weak, again, depending upon where you stand. The city of Corinth in about 55 AD was a, a wealthy trading center and one of the dominant cultural perspectives in a wealthy trading center at that time was to be successful is to be self-reliant, well-informed, a powerful and influential person. Sounds strangely familiar to me. Paul identifies kind of two examples of this and mindset in our passage today. First, he says, Jews demand signs. Judaism at this time was rooted in seeking tangible proof, evidence, signs from God, particularly signs of power and strength and might. You, you might remember in the reading of the stories of Jesus, some people demanding this of Jesus. Give us a sign like Moses did back in the day. Water out of a rock. 
manna in the desert, parting the Red Sea. Come on, Jesus. Show us power. Show us strength. And Jesus' only response that I can remember, the only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah. Dead in the belly of a fish for three days. Paul's response is similar to these demanding a sign. We proclaim Christ and him crucified. Greeks, the philosophers in our midst, relied on reasoning and rational argumentation. They relied on being clever and persuasive and eloquent. One of their plaques read, The wise man is king, and to him belong all things. The gods do not feel or have unreliable emotions, and they would certainly not suffer. The gods are removed from such things to dependably execute their power and rule over the universe. Paul's response, God weeps. God suffers and died on the cross, shaming the wise. These understandings, along with our own cultural understandings of success and wisdom and power, had begun to to creep into their church and perhaps have begun to creep into the church in our time as well, relying upon signs and wisdoms and boasting in their own eloquence and persuasiveness, insight and status with society and the church. What signs do you demand of God? Maybe you wouldn't use the word demand. But where do you look for wisdom? What signs or wisdom would you need to uh, exist or come about to prove that East Liberty Presbyterian Church is indeed a thriving and faithful and upright community of believers? When and where do you ever so subtly take confidence in your own self and strength? Not that there's anything wrong with being confident in yourself. What achievements uh, uh, or assets do we ever so subtly believe that give us a special standing before God? Education, wealth, reputation, social location? Only you can answer those questions this morning. But whatever answers are stirring inside of you in the quietness of your own heart, Paul says the way of the cross is a stumbling block and foolish to, foolishness to those who build lives upon self-reliant wisdom and power. In fact, I think he's inviting us to let go of that, to surrender it and even crucify all forms of self-reliant power and wisdom and embracing the seeming weakness and foolishness of the way of the cross. Friends, this is hard work. These are hard words. Some years ago, I was listening to lectures by Richard Rohr, and he said something that has stuck with me to this day. Spiritual energy is stored in solitude, loneliness, boredom, suffering, and fear. Spiritual energy is stored in solitude, loneliness, boredom, suffering, and fear. I don't know about you, but that list of things are the kinds of things that I try to avoid in my life. And yet I think there is a subtle truth to what he's saying. They are crucibles of transformation. They are storehouses of spiritual energy. To be alone, lonely, bored, suffering, afraid is foolish and weak in the eyes of the world. And they are the message of the cross. And they are the wisdom and the power of God. We are not trained to hold or welcome solitude, loneliness, boredom, suffering, weakness, foolishness, and fear. We're trained in being strong and smart and independent and hard workers who can figure things out. We are taught that strong and smart people don't struggle and suffer and are able to control and explain and fix our problems, avoid loneliness, boredom, suffering, and fear. Are you with me? 
But this, my friends, is not the way of the cross. This is not the way of Jesus. This is not what it means to follow our leader. Jesus told us in his teaching that this was his way. It was his literal way, and it was our metaphoric way. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. If you want to save your life, you must lose your life for the sake of the gospel. If you want to be my disciple, you must daily take up your cross and follow me. And we don't even have time to go into the litany of the, of the Beatitudes that David read for us this morning. But blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. I don't know about you, but I don't put that on my resume. Friends, the cross and the way of the cross is foolish and weak, and yet it is the heart of our Christian faith. It is the movement of the life of Jesus on this earth. It is what we celebrate at this feast at the Lord's table once a month. It is what some call the Paschal mystery. This transformational journey in our lives, just like Jesus, of moving from death to life of letting go of the present life and the present spirit that we're in to give way for a fuller life and a new spirit to arise in us and among us. Perhaps you know what I'm talking about in the loss of a literal loved one in the recent years or days of your life. But this happens in all kinds of scenarios. As we age, an invitation comes to us through our bodies aching and our minds forgetting. Let go and surrender to our reality and belief in youth and youthfulness. Not that I would know anything about that. But we are invited in those moments when our body speaks to us. You can't do what you used to do. Do you name it? Can you grieve it and accept the loss that you're not as young as you used to be? You can't remember the things you used to remember. You can't do the things you used to do. And we have a choice in that moment. We can cling to our youth and the dream of being young or the past of being young, or we can let it go, embracing a more humble, slower, and wiser season of life. It comes when our children leave the house, if you don't know, I'm a recent empty nester. And we're invited to name and grieve and accept the loss of the fact that our children will never be that age again. We will never parent them in that same way with all the kids in the house, and sometimes that's a nice thing. <laughs> but when they leave, we can cling to the former way of parenting, to the former nostalgia of what the house was like. Or we can begin to let go and surrender our children so they can become adults and we can have a new kind of relationship with them. This invitation can come when, like this week, peace and justice are thwarted and evil seems victorious in the world. When the murder of yet another black man happens at the hands of five men whose vocation and calling are to protect and serve. The way of the cross in that moment like that invites us to grieve and mourn and wail and lament and join mothers throughout the centuries who have lost sons at the hands of oppressive systems. Mothers like Rachel in the Old Testament. Mothers like Mary herself, the mother of Jesus, and the mother of Tyree Nichols. And weep and refuse to be comforted, for our children are no more. And it can happen even with God and the church. All of us at various stages of our faith and in the life of the church are invited to let go of the God of our past or the church of our past. 
to recognize the God of the present who is walking with us today and the church that exists right here and right now. We can cling to our past understanding and experiences of God and the joy and the consolation that we found in those moments. Or we can receive the invitation to name that reality, grieve it and mourn it, and accept the reality of what is right now so that whatever that God wants to bring that is new can arise and ascend among us. And friends, on this last point, I have to wonder how many of us who've been at ELPC for some time are in this space. We sit almost three full years into a pandemic that shut down our church for some time and completely altered what we had all previously knew to be church. And things are not the same as they were before the pandemic. And dare I say that that way of being church no longer exists because we are not back there. And we are not alone in this. Churches across the country are struggling, wrestling, grieving, mourning, trying to figure out what does it mean to be church today? And in our context, if that weren't enough, we are now nine months on the other side of our senior pastor resigning and working to reestablish stability in this time of transition, thanks to Pastor Heather and Pastor Patrice. And even that transition that we thought was going to happen in a particular way by getting an interim pastor did not expect, did not work out the way many of us expected us. I know that's true for me. If you don't know, the church has asked me to take on a little more work, and I certainly did not expect that. <laughs> the church that ELPC was three years ago and nine months ago doesn't exist anymore. And there is loss in that, even death that has happened. Can we name that? Can we grieve and mourn that together? Can we begin to move on the journey of acceptance with that? I'm winding it down. Ronald Rollheiser in his book, Holy Longing, puts it this way. Unless we mourn properly, our hurts, our losses, life's unfairness, our shattered dreams, and all the life that we once had, but that now has passed us by. We will live either in an unhealthy fantasy or an ever-intensifying bitterness. Let me just read that beginning and end part again. Unless we mourn properly our hurts and losses, we will live either in an unhealthy fantasy, how it used to be, or an ever-intensifying bitterness, we can't get back to how it used to be. Friends, naming loss, mourning and grieving and embracing the death of something we loved in this life is the way of the cross. It feels foolish counterintuitive to welcome the loss into our lives and embrace it. It feels sometimes like an admission of failure and it can become a stumbling block to us. But mourning and grieving requires admission of that pain and emptiness and suffering and feel, fear and loneliness. It can appear weak. And yet we preach Christ crucified which to those of us who are being saved, which I include all of you here this morning, it is the power of God. Amen? Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies to produce many seeds, its life and journey is not doing what it intended to do in this world. Where do you find yourself in this journey with the cross today? What is your invitation from God this morning? Where are you in the journey of naming a death, grieving, mourning, and letting go? 
What might be something in the past that you're clinging to? What new spirit and life are you aware of that is trying to emerge in you and in us here at East Liberty Presbyterian Church? Let me close with this illustration again from Ronald Rollheiser. You remember the story of Mary Magdala. She encounters Jesus as he's risen, right? And she thinks he's the gardener. She doesn't recognize him. And Ronald Rollheiser picks up here. Initially, she does not know who he is, and she supposes him to be the gardener. But immediately upon recognizing him, she tries to throw her arms around him. Jesus, for his part, tells her, Mary, do not cling to me. What lies behind Jesus' reluctance to let Mary touch him? Mary Magdala herself, had we ever found her gospel, would I suspect explain it in this way? I never suspected resurrection and to be so painful, to leave me weeping, with joy, to have met you alive and smiling outside an empty tomb with regret, not because I've lost you, but because I've lost you and how I had you in understandable, touchable, kissable, clingable flesh, not as fully Lord, but as a graspable human. I want to cling Despite your protest, cling to your body, cling to your and my clingable humanity, cling to what we had, our past. But I know, if I cling, you cannot ascend. I will be left clinging to your former self, unable to receive your present spirit. Friends, the way of the cross is one of naming, grieving our losses, beginning to accept them, not clinging to what was so that the new life and spirit may emerge in each of us and in the collective us. By God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, may it be so.